Let me uh, start by uh, thanking the organizers for inviting me here. It's an honor to present my work to you. Um, so uh, as you all know, probably, uh, most plants uh, can be attacked by a wide range of uh, microbial pathogens. And uh, these, uh, uh, of the interaction between these pathogens and the plant are often studied because this is uh, important uh, for agriculture. But uh, when these uh, interactions are studied, mostly they're oversimplified. Um, they study the interaction between the pathogen and the plant, but there's many more uh, microbes present. Over 10 to the 10th uh, bacteria per gram of root can be found uh, in the rhizosphere. There's reports of over 30,000 uh, species per gram of uh, rhizosphere. Uh, and I'd like to argue today that it's the totality of these microbes that uh, determine uh, plant health. <clears throat> so uh, this is a simplification of this uh, enormous uh, diversity. So uh, in the uh, rhizosphere, there is some uh, pathogens present. Um, does the pointer work or? Uh, well, oh yeah. So, uh, and the, well, the ma majority of uh, microbes might not have a direct effect on the plant or the pathogen, but some microbes are beneficial to the plant uh, because they uh, either uh, inhibit the pa pathogens uh, directly by competition for nutrients or uh, pr production of uh, antimicrobial compounds, or indirectly by uh, inducing uh, systemic resistant in, resistance in the plant. So. Uh, I thought uh, I spent two slides on uh, induced systemic resistance because it's uh, something we work on in Utrecht. Uh, so uh, it's been found that when you, when plants are colonized by specific uh, beneficial microbes, uh, these microbes can induce uh, resistance uh, in the entire plant. So when a uh, pathogen attacks the, these uh, plants that are colonized, the plant uh, uh, can respond more strongly uh, to these pathogens. So uh, in Utrecht we mainly use uh, Pseudomonas bacteria, uh, but also it's been shown that uh, bacilli and uh, some fungi can induce resistance. So uh, here's an exa a rather old example where uh, plants were colonized by three beneficial Pseudomonas. These are our bed strains. They can all induce uh, resistance, uh, but uh, uh, ISR is a very uh, plant-specific uh, phenomenon. So on Arabidopsis, only these two Pseudomonas uh, bacteria can uh, induce resistance. And you see that if you infect these plants with uh, Pseudomonas syringae uh, in the leaves, uh, the plants that were colonized by WCS417 and WCS358 become uh, uh, less diseased and uh, control. So uh, it's just something I wanted to mention, but I'll focus on the microbiome. So as I said, the majority of microbes might not have a direct effect on the pathogen or uh, the plant, but as long as they're active, they will be interacting with other bacteria, and they might have an indirect effect on the pathogens. So I'd like to argue today that it's this totality of uh, microbes and the way they interact that determines uh, the outcome uh, of a pathogen uh, infection. And the best argument uh, I can uh, give for this uh, is uh, the existence of disease suppressive soils. So these are soils in which uh, plants do not get dis diseased even though uh, there's a virulent pathogen uh, present. So this is a really nice example with the sugar beet seedlings that uh, grow in a disease suppressive soil. Uh, these seedlings grow in a soil that's uh, uh, physically and chemically the same. Uh, taken from an adjacent field. And when both uh, these seedlings were infected with the Rhizoctonia solani, uh, the seedlings growing in the conducive soil get really sick, whereas they, these uh, stay healthy. So we know that the suppressiveness is uh, microbiological uh, in the origin, because uh, when we pasteurize these soils, the suppressiveness disappears. And we, when we mix a small part of the uh, suppressive soil in the conducive soil, the conducive soil becomes suppressive. So uh, disease suppressive soils have been found for a wide range of uh, plant species and uh, plant diseases, but uh, arguably the best studied uh, example of, uh, of disease suppressive soils 
our soils that have become suppressive to uh, take all disease and weed, take all that's caused, caused by a fungus, going by the meat, um, And uh, this disease typically uh, develops anywhere in the world when you start growing wheat. And for the first uh, couple of seasons, this uh, disease uh, appears and quickly increases, which is logical because you have a virulent pathogen and susceptible host, so the inoculum increases. But uh, after a certain amount uh, of years in a very strong uh, disease outbreak, uh, the disease suddenly disappears. Um, and this was found to be uh, 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 correlated to the, an increase in uh, the abundance of sp specific uh, Pseudomonas bacteria that produce uh, antibiotic 2,4-diacetylfluoroglucinol, or DAPG. And this uh, uh, antibiotic inhibits the fungus that causes the, this disease. So uh, we're really interested in uh, understanding this phenomenon and what uh, causes this increase in these uh, bacteria. So uh, because uh, before this suppressiveness uh, develops, uh, you always have a disease, a big disease outbreak. It was already uh, hypothesized in the 70s that uh, uh, it is the plant that at this point uh, cries out for help and uh, starts recruiting these beneficial bacteria. So this is what we uh, set out uh, to test. Um, so we know that all plants have a very uh, intricate uh, uh, immune system uh, that uh, revolves about, uh, around the main uh, defense hormones, uh, salicylic acid and jasmonic acid. So uh, these hormones are produced when uh, uh, plants are infected. Um, salicylic acid mostly produced in response to biotrophic uh, pathogens, whereas jasmonic acid is uh, produced in response to necrotrophic pathogens and in insects. So these uh, hormones uh, activate local defenses and they also lead to uh, uh, the induction of systemic resistance. So uh, we wondered whether these two uh, hormones were also involved then in the systemic signaling that leads to recruitment of beneficials. So uh, we uh, set up this experiment where we grew uh, the model plant Herbidopsis for five weeks in uh, natural soil. Uh, and then uh, we uh, infected the above ground plant parts with a biotrophic pathogen, Yalaparanospora Herbidopsidis, or a necrotrophic pathogen, uh, Botrytis cinerea. And then we mimicked these uh, uh, di diseases by repeatedly dipping the leaves in uh, either a salicylic acid uh, a hormone solution or a jasmonic acid uh, solution. And we uh, <coughs> analyzed changes in the, in the rhizosphere uh, using uh, phyllo chips uh, in two separate time points, so one week and two weeks after the start of the treatment. So these uh, phyllo chips are uh, a micro ray uh, containing probes uh, based on the 16S ribosomal uh, uh, DNA. Of over, and you can uh, determine the presence and abundance of uh, over 60,000 uh, bacterial OTUs in uh, archaea with these chips. So we analyzed the uh, rhizospheres, and we found uh, 341 OTUs in all of our samples, the majority of which were uh, uh, proteobacteria, firmicutes, and uh, uh, bacteroidoitites, which is uh, re really typical for uh, most soils. And if we then look uh, at the abundance of these OTUs in all of our samples with a principal component analysis, uh, well, we do that here. Uh, so the principal component analysis compares entire communities. Each dot in this uh, graph uh, is one phyllo chip. Uh, the, the squares are uh, after uh, one week, the triangles after two weeks. And uh, the first principal component explains 70% of the variability, whereas the second component only 6%. So we see that uh, uh, the biggest uh, uh, difference, so, so sort of, I forgot to say, but uh, well, the closer the uh, dots are to, to each other, the more similar to the communities are. So we see that uh, the biggest difference in all our samples is really uh, the difference between uh, unplanted soils and uh, planted uh, soil samples, uh, which is a 
phenomenon known as the rhizosphere effect, and this is already known for over 100 years. But uh, we do see some differences uh, uh, among along the second uh, component that separates the uh, Yalopiranospray infected uh, uh, plant samples uh, from uh, the others. So uh, if we then look how the uh, separate OTUs are related uh, in this principal component analysis, we see uh, two large groups. Where is it? Well, the, the pointer doesn't really function, but there's a big group of uh, uh, OTUs on the right side that uh, are correlated with the plant soil, uh, samples. So these OTUs all increase strongly from the bulk soil to the rhizosphere soil. On the left, there's a smaller group of uh, uh, bulk soil-related OTUs that are more abundant in the bulk soil and decrease in the uh, rhizospheres. And there's three OTUs on top that uh, uh, really differ on the second uh, principal component uh, that separated the allopurinospora infected uh, plants from the rest. So if we look at the uh, abundance of these three OTUs, it's uh, the stenotrophomonas, exanthomonas, and the microbacterium, and we see that uh, uh, already in the first time point, uh, these OTUs uh, increase significantly in abundance compared to control uh, treated plants. And then uh, in the second week, uh, they uh, really uh, are among the most abundant OTUs in these rhizospheres. Uh, the other treatments uh, also show some uh, significant increases compared to control, but never consistently. So um, what we really see is that these OTUs are specifically recruited when plants are infected uh, by uh, Yala Peronospora. So, uh, um, well, we were really interested in these OTUs. We had stored uh, the rhizospheres at the end of uh, this experiment. So uh, after we analyzed these results, we took uh, the rhizospheres of uh, Yalaparanospora infected plants from the freezer, and uh, we started isolating a lot of bacteria on a wide range of uh, uh, different media. And uh, indeed, we found uh, Antimonas uh, uh, isolates, three of them, and also three microbacterium uh, isolates. But uh, when we further analyzed uh, these uh, isolates, they proved to be uh, isogenic. And there was also one uh, Stenotrophomonas uh, isolate among them. We uh, sequenced the 16S uh, ribosomal uh, RNA of these uh, isolates, and they proved to be a perfect match to the probes on the filer chip that uh, identified uh, our recruited strains. We were pretty sure that these are the bacteria that uh, were recruited. So we're now. Uh, continuing our research with these strains. So we know that uh, three, these three OTUs were uh, recruited when uh, above ground defenses were activated. Uh, we've isolated the three strains, and now we're uh, working on the biological re relevance of uh, this pathogen-induced recruitment and the mechanisms of uh, recruitment. This is ongoing work, but there's some things I can already uh, uh, share with you. So. Um, our hypothesis is that when plants are infected, they start secreting something in the rhizosphere that uh, makes that these uh, bacteria uh, increase in abundance. Uh, and we considered that either these bacteria then uh, uh, are in competition for these uh, nutrients secreted by the plants, or they're really uh, recruited as a consortium. So we tested how these uh, uh, bacteria interact, and we uh, looked at uh, biofilm formation uh, on uh, plastic uh, bags. <coughs> uh, and we found that uh, uh, by themselves, uh, well, the xanthomonas and the microbacterium don't form a lot of biofilm. Uh, the stenotrophomonas uh, uh, can reasonably well uh, uh, form a biofilm. But uh, when you start combining these three strains, uh, the biofilm uh, becomes much uh, more thicker, and especially the combination of three uh, gives the most, uh, uh, the most thick uh, biofilm. So I think this is already an indication that these bacteria are actually recruited as a consortium. Um, we're also uh, looking at the biological uh, re relevance of, these, uh, of this recruitment. So uh, I've obviously framed this, that uh, these bacteria are uh, beneficial, but, you know, Xanthomonas makes you think that it also might be a 
plant uh, pathogen, so uh, we really uh, grew these plants uh, with these s separate bacteria and uh, tested uh, their performance. Uh, I think they're not uh, pathogenic to uh, Arabidopsis, at least. Uh, so uh, we want to demonstrate that these have beneficial effect to the plant. We're uh, con uh, performing the ISR assays at the moment, but I don't want to <coughs> tell something about that yet. But we also tested uh, the antag antagonistic effects of these bacteria against the range of uh, pathogens. Uh, they uh, showed really no antagonism against any of the fungi. We tested one uh, oomycete, not the, the Alapo and Rospa, which we used originally in the uh, uh, experiment, because this is an obligate biotroph. But uh, uh, the only pathogen that these bacteria could inhibit was uh, uh, Phytophthora capsicae, which is uh, quite interesting, I think. Uh, so uh, the Xanthomonas stenotrophomonas clearly inhibit. The microbacterium also inhibits a bit, but it's not really visible in this uh, picture. So, but if we uh, quantify um, uh, the inhibition zone, and we also start combining these three uh, strains, we again see that uh, by themselves they can uh, already inhibit the, uh, the Phytophthora reasonably well, but if you start combining them, uh, they uh, perform uh, much better. So this is uh, something we will really want to look into. Um, so uh, it's the end of my talk already. Uh, I work in uh, uh, Utrecht in the plant microbe interactions uh, group that's headed by uh, Cornet Petersen, uh, but I uh, work mostly with uh, Peter Bakker. Uh, this work was funded uh, by uh, the ERC grant uh, of uh, Cornet. Uh, we collaborate uh, with um, Met de Burmel and Jacob Herschend of the uh, University of Copenhagen for the Synergy and Biofilms, and uh, Elias Boualal is a master student who's now working on the biological relevance of these uh, three strains. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>